Good afternoon. I'm Ed Gallagher, President of the American Scandinavian Foundation, and I'm delighted, uh, very delighted, to welcome you all to this afternoon's symposium, The Silent Uncanny, a special symposium which has been planned in conjunction with our current exhibition, Painting Tranquility, Masterworks by Wilhelm Hammershoi from SMK, the National Gallery of Denmark. The event today uh, is done in conjunction with an exhibition which has been a great success here in our galleries. I hope you've had a chance to see it. If not, the galleries will remain open after the symposium. This is the first exhibition in New York in over 15 years that is dedicated to the work of Hammershoi and was prompted in part by the desire to make SMK, the National Gallery of Denmark, better known in this country and in particular the American Friends of SMK, which are represented here today by Hannah Storing, the director here. Uh, SMK is one of the great treasures of Scandinavia with collections uh, spanning the centuries. We hope to make it better well known through this exhibition which uh, showcases their great collection of Hammershaw, of course, one of the great artists of the Nordic world. Since its founding over a century ago, the American Scandinavian Foundation has been dedicated to the advancement of educational and cultural exchange between the US and the Nordic countries through fellowships, cultural grants, publications, internships, and a number of programs which have been presented for many, many years, but most notably in the past 15 years since we opened Scandinavia House. This, one of the first projects that was sponsored by the American Scandinavian Foundation, notably, was an exhibition of contemporary Scandinavian art, which was organized in 1912 and was one of the first times Hammershoi was seen in, in this country. In the 15 years since we opened Scandinavia House, we have presented over 60 exhibitions, and several recent ones have also included Hammershoi, including Luminous Modernism, Scandinavian Art Comes to America, 1912, which was our centennial exhibition presented five years ago, as well as Danish paintings of the Golden Age through the Modern Breakthrough, the collection of John Loeb. Other notable exhibitions we've recently presented include North by New York, Nord New Nordic Art, curated by Robert Storr, and Munch Warhol and the Multiple Image, curated by Dr. Patricia Berman. As a private, nonprofit organization, the ASF and Scandinavia House rely on contributions to make all our programs possible, and we are deeply grateful to the generous supporters of this symposium, which include Notably, the Scan Design of Seattle, Scan, Scan Design Foundation located in Seattle, and Henry P. Godfrey. Also, hearty thanks to the individuals and organizations whose generosity has supported the presentation of this exhibition here at Scandinavia House, and most notably the A.P. Muller and Chastine McKinney Muller Foundation, Ambassador John Loeb, Ellen Braestrup Strickler, Danska Markets, the Vincent of Mulford Foundation, and the Consulate General of Denmark, which provided a grant in support of programs. We're also very, very grateful to all of the scholars who are joining us today and will be shortly taking the stage. And most especially, we're grateful to the moderator of the evening of the symposium, Dr. Patricia Berman of Wellesley College, who is the principal organizer of the symposium, as well as served as a key advisor in the organization of the exhibition. Dr. Berman has, been a, has had a long history with the American Scandinavian Foundation, beginning in 1982 when she served as a research associate on the landmark exhibition sponsored by the ASF, Northern Light, Realism and Symbolism in Scandinavian Painting, 1880 to 1910, which was curated by Kirk Varnado. Two years later, in 1984, and again in 1985, the ASF provided a fellowship for Dr. Berman to pursue her studies in Norway. And several years after that, in January 1992, she joined the ASF Trustee Committee on Fellowships and Grants, a position she still holds. And in 2012, she was elected an advisory trustee of the American Scandinavian Foundation. She's an art historian of great note, and her full bio is included on the program you received, so I won't belabor that, but I did want to mention that she has also been involved in organizing a number of exhibitions. As I mentioned, the Munch Warhol and Multiple Image, as well as Luminous Modernism, Scandinavian Art, Comes to America, and other exhibitions throughout the country, including um, Munch's Laboratory, The Path to Aula at the Munch Museum in 2012, Edvard Munch and Modern Life of the Soul at the Museum of Modern Art, and Edvard Munch and Women, Image and Myth, 1997, which was presented at the San Diego Museum of Art and many other institutions. She is the author of many articles and books, 
including very notably in another light Danish painting in the 19th century, which has been published both here and in Europe and the United Kingdom. It's always a great pleasure to be able to welcome Patricia Berman to the stage of Scandinavia House, and I'd like you now to join me in welcoming her, Dr. Patricia Berman. Thank you for that lovely introduction, and I, I also want to extend thanks for the support of this um, symposium, and I'd also like to thank Ariana Tiziani, who did all of the work to make this happen, and Kyle Reinhardt, who is uh, making sure that we're all comfortable and that we actually have a projection system as we go forward. Um, it's a real, it's a pleasure to be able to join together today. Um, I have a few remarks I'd like to make before introducing the, uh, the speakers that we have invited here. We're very lucky today to have internationally renowned speakers, each of whom will speak in, uh, to address their particular research specialty. Almost none of them have done significant research on Hammersoy, but they have done uh, groundbreaking work on artists who are related to Hammersoy, and then we have a Hammersoy scholar as well. So it's going to be a smorgasbord. I'm glad someone laughed, thank you. <laughs> Feel free to laugh anytime. <laughs> um, let me go back. The Danish painter Wilhelm Hammershoi was greatly admired in his day, celebrated locally in Copenhagen as well as in London and Paris, primarily for his interior scenes, representing the apartments that he and his wife, Ida Ilsted, shared in Copenhagen. And to remind you that his birthday was 1864 and he died in 1916, short life. Hammershoi, uh, seen here in a self-portrait from 1911, is an artist whose work fell out of favor during much of the 20th century, but because has become a source of fascination again since the 1980s. In a series of exhibitions here in New York, which included those that um, Edward Gallagher just mentioned, um, he is now really, both here and actually abroad, one of the most internationally acclaimed of Scandinavian painters, probably if you can name well, one, it's Edvard Munch, but if you can name two, it's probably Wilhelm Hammershoi, or at least it will be after today. From the later 1890s uh, on and off through his death in 1916, Hammershoi and his wife Ida inhabited apartments in Christianshaven, the oldest section of Copenhagen, in which Ida modeled and Wilhelm painted repeatedly in a, um, a procession of images that may be seen, as the title of this exhibition, exhibition upstairs proclaims, as tranquil, as painted tranquility. Yet for all of the austerity and intimacy of the scenes that Hammershoi produced, that the Hammershoi's produced together, he the painter and she the model, there lurks a strangeness, a sense of a kind of a haunted suspension of the psychological in the scenes. So much so that Tom Harper's recent film, Hopper's recent, Hooper's recent film, um, The Danish Girl, uh, still of what you see on the scene, capitalizes on the effect of Hammershoi's reduced aesthetic to frame the narrative of that film of doubled identities and the hidden narratives of domesticity. If any, I'm assuming many people here have seen that film. There are many potential ways of looking at Hammershoi's work as intimacy, as melancholy, as tranquility, as a highly reductive story of childlessness, of potentially a loveless marriage on the one hand, or intense marital fidelity on the other hand, of stereotypical Nordic inwardness, and so on. Um, Bridget Altdorf of Princeton University recently published an important article on Hammershoi in the journal Critical Inquiry, in which she reads his work through the Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard's Either Or, in terms of the philosophical speculations on the aesthetics and ethics of marriage, of repetition and labor. I only recently read Professor Altdorf's article, and I would have loved to bring her here today to have her voice in the proceedings, so instead I'm just throwing out the reference and hoping that uh, you will all find and read that article, because it's exceptional. But today, probing the theme of Hammershoi's so-called tranquility, our speakers will provide a different lens onto Hammershoi's work of the notion of the uncanny, of doubling, of the presence of something psychological contained in oil and canvas. 
I show here Hammersoy's interior with artificial light from 1909. Um, from our exhibition upstairs. And I'd ask you to consider the tight values, the darkened arena, the shadows in the background that are barely discernible, and the two candles on a tabletop. Sustained looking at this painting becomes dizzying as the candles seem to converge and then separate, replicating the effect of a drowsy or perhaps drunken stare in which optical convergence is troubled. The painting itself is vignetted, an effect that we know represents um, the, it's, it's barely discernible here, but you can see it upstairs, represents an oval mirror owned by the artist, turned on its side, suggesting that the doubled candles are themselves the double of a reflection, itself doubled in painted representation, a subtle speculation about the instability of representation itself. Look carefully at Hammersoy's paintings, and what initially seems to be a scene of easy quiescence becomes uncanny. He's, his seemingly pristine architectural geometries, whose orthogonal lines created by doors and furniture um, should converge into an anticipated one-point perspective. When carefully analyzed, however, they all reveal strange vectoring with no convergence as possible, one point, three point, or any other logical perspective. The canvases are therefore infinitesimally unstable, something that's hard to register when you look at the canvases, but a sense of unease creeps into them as you see them. There's also an unexpected reversal of anticipated visual acuity in his canvases, the greatest and most detailed clarity in the painting that you see here on the left occurs not in the foreground, but in the deep, fictive space at the back of the canvas with this porcelain bowl. The porcelain vessel was painted with crystalline precision, whereas the foreground is more sort of feathery and diaphanous. Such a reversal of the anticipated depth of field is the careful artifact of optical devices and photographs, an assertion of a kind of a reversed looking. The gulf between the expected geometries and focus of a plain domestic interior is precisely, between, is precisely the space of the uncanny, the defamiliarization of the familiar, the effect of known and trusted material circumstances through which concealed or repressed memories, histories, and meaning bleed through. Sigmund Freud's concept of the uncanny, or the unheimlich, proceeds from the notion of the heimlich, or the homey, the cozy the familiar, the comfortable. To quote the art historian Marcia Morton, quote, because it's generated by what we most trust and what we best understand, ourselves and our relationships, the unheimlich is profoundly destabilizing. The homey and the cozy ignites the unfathomable. There are also technical reasons, as noted a moment ago, why Hammershoi's works invest the prosaic life of his home and his studio with a sense of dislocation and suspension, his very procedure of blending paint, in which the artist began with bright colors, um, you know, sort of out of the tube, uh, and then mixed them with extraordinary care and craft on his palette into an infinite shade, a scale of grays, replacing the more robust colors suggested of life lived with something abstemious and nuanced. His control over a tight scale of values has led his biographers to liken his work to that of James McNeil Whistler, such as this comparison here, an artist whom he did admire and in his painting of his mother and the left did at times even emulate. Hammershoi's is an art of refusal, the refusal to celebrate the kind of gemütlich domestic interior, brimming with the trappings of fin de siècle well-being, such as the Danish painter Petter Severn Kroyer's um, uh, representation on the left-hand side of the screen of the uh, art patron Heinrich Hirschsprung and his family, or the famous images by Carl Larsen on the right-hand side of the screen of his own home. Um, overflowing with things and people and food and talk and light and children and cookies, sort of an excess of plenitude. All of this replaced with cream color interiors and the minimal display of Biedermeier furniture and antique prints and porcelain in the work of Hammershoi. 
In this refusal of the new age of, of Danish prosperity, and in his representation of both domestic spaces and city and landscapes as devoid of people, of color, and of movement, and in his evocation and vitiation of both the modern present and the imperial past, his work has been likened to that of Giorgio de Chirico. His domestic scenes have been likened to those of contemporary symbolist artists in the Nordic countries, such as Helena Scharfbeck, whose work you see here on the right, to Dutch Golden Age painters, such as Vermeer, whom you see here on the right, to interior scenes by his contemporaries in France and elsewhere, such as Edouard Vuillard on the right, and then most particularly to the work of the American Edward Hopper, the seeming stasis and sense of perpetual waiting haunting Hammershoy's canvases as elsewhere. In Hammershoy's paintings, we rarely see what Ida Elsted, his wife and model, is actually doing. The very fact of not knowing brings forth our own narrative imagination. What the artist suppresses in the austere decor and monochrome palette in the silent backwards facing model um, is precisely what we impose. Like the contemporary artist Gregory Cruzden's suspended interiors, we create a cinematic valence for Hammershoy's works. We will explore today, all of the scholars who will be speaking today, um, are going to be um, looking at these various other artists through considerations of Hamm Hammershoy's work. We're going to be reading Hammershoy's work through the art of others, um, through that of his French contemporaries, his Dutch predecessors, and the youngsters de Chirico and <laughs> the youngsters de Chirico and Hopper, uh, and Alfred Hitchcock. Um, this is what our scholars will be presenting us with. It's the effect of the uncanny, the doubling, the seeing of things, and the inventing of narrative, the complex dialogue between hominess and the unheimlich precisely the hooks that make Hammershoy's work, his opalescent canvases, so astringently seductive. And we pose the question, which we'll discuss later, all of us together, how do paintings become so haunted? The first speaker uh, will actually speak directly about Hammershoy, and I'd like to um, invite Tor Mednick um, to come to the podium. You have his full biography, uh, before you, the biographies of the speakers have been printed, so we'll move things along a little, except that he was very modest in the biography that he offered us. And um, I want to say that in addition to what you can read about him, he has taught at the University of Copenhagen and has worked at the Staatens Museum for Kunst in Copenhagen, and therefore has worked with this collection intimately over many, many years. So, Dr. Mednick. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for having me, and thank you, Ed and Ari and everyone else, for arranging this symposium. It's uh, terrific to be here again. Um, you'll notice that my title, my subtitle uh, here, refers to incompleteness rather than availing uh, the more usual term of non finito or, or lack of finish. Um, when I started to think of the ways that the uncanny might apply to Hammershoy, what immediately occurred to me was the sense that many of us have when faced with his canvases, and this is what uh, Dr. Berman was uh, just talking about, that something seems to be missing. Uh, it's not really a matter of things being unfinished or unrealized. It's more a matter of Hammershoy's omissions being intentional components of finished work. Uh, Dr. Berman and I have written and talked about a certain aspect of this, which has to do with Hammershoy's tendency to evacuate narrative content, uh, particularly in pictures that appear as though they really ought to have some. Uh, in pictures such as these, Hammershoy creates spaces that very clearly harken back to both the Danish and Dutch Golden Ages, uh, but they do so at, only at the level of presentation. Uh, the narrative or moral content that one would expect to be able to read in works like this, the content that invariably informed the interiors of the Dutch school, for instance, uh, is absent in Hammershoy. And the uncommonly wide range of speculation that these pictures have inspired in critics and writers over the past century often seems motivated by the insistent desire to fill the apparent void that they leave, uh, that, 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 um, they leave with some sort of meaning. 
Uh, there is then a sort of glitch in these works that often leaves the viewer with the feeling that something is not quite as it should be. Um, what's interesting is that this sort of disharmony, as it were, appears throughout Hammershoi's work. For instance, my colleague Gertrude Ulsner has noticed something about Hammershoi's landscapes. Uh, at first glance, a picture such as this one here um, appears to be fairly straightforward in terms of composition. The view is presented more or less at eye level, uh, and what the eye sees is comfortingly stable and parallel to the surface of the picture. In this sense, it may be taken as a conventional sort of window on, onto the world. Um, in another important sense, however, it diverges from this model. In Hammershoi's landscape pictures, one element that is traditionally central to landscape views is very often omitted, and that is a way into the scene. Uh, as Ernstner explains, it is a characteristic of Hammershoi's landscapes that they, quote, do not provide the viewer a means of entry into the landscape space, close quote. And there is no doubt in Ernstner's mind that Hammershoi was producing landscapes that intentionally countervailed the traditional approach of welcoming the viewer to enter the, quote, divine spiritual landscape, close quote. When he does paint his landscapes with roads and paths that the viewer could potentially traverse, uh, they tend not to lead into the picture, but to trail off to the side, leaving most of what is on view beyond our access. When, as in the picture on the left, uh, there are no roads at all, the foreground is sort of an enigmatic space, far too immaterial and insubstantial to be trodden on. Now, we can talk, uh, and have talked, uh, a lot about what Hammershoi does not do. Um, but there are ways of addressing the peculiar uncandiness, perhaps, uh, the, pe the peculiar uh, uh, sort of contradiction of expectation uh, he achieves in more affirmative terms. Uh, Hammershoi has always been seen and treated as something of an outlier in the history of Danish art and of modernism, uh, for that matter. But there is a way in which he actually is not. Uh, if we begin to look at what he is doing from his perspective rather than from ours, his achievement begins to take on a different character. Most of the time uh, when I am dealing with Hammershoi, it's the interiors that I concentrate on. Uh, for some reason this time, I wanted to look at more at the landscapes. Uh, and almost from the start, I had this quote by Hammershoi's fellow Dane, Harold Giersing, in mind. Uh, Nature is nothing, the image of it, everything. Um, in the context particularly of Danish art history, the idea that landscape was meaningless, that is the actual landscape, was meaningless, that it was only truly expressed when it was represented in a constructive image, was in one sense quite a radical idea. And to understand that, we have to spend a brief period with this guy here, uh, who is a towering figure. Uh, in 19th century Danish painting. As a professor at the Royal Academy, C.W. Eckersberg was central to the emergence of the Danish school. Um, of central importance to Eckersberg's philosophy of art was his belief in the primacy of the uninflected encounter with nature. Uninflected is him talking, right? Um, a born realist in this sense. He felt it was the highest responsibility of art and thereby the artist, to communicate the sensory authenticity of lived experience, thereby to represent and resonate the familiar world of its audience. Uh, quote, let us with assiduity scrutinize nature's great book, he declared. Let us endeavor to eradicate all kinds of prejudice and seek out the nearest path to the goal, namely truth, close quote. It is important here to note that the truth to which Eckersberg referred was not merely the literal transcription of what met the eye. Uh, certainly an extreme perceptual clarity was important for him. Um, but he also here meant the deeply harmonious beauty of nature, the sort of the fundamental image as he called it. Um, the artist's privilege lay in the insight to perceive this image. Uh, the artist's job was to use the tools of her trade uh, as, as curator Mayanna Sobu has put it, quote, to filter out the accidental and unbeautiful in nature, uh, that the artwork might give us a true picture of nature's ideal, close quote. The tool that Eckersberg most famously advocated for the construction of compositional balance and pictorial harmony was linear perspective. 
uh, a vociferous scholar on the subject, Eckersberg published two highly influential manuals on perspective in 1831 and 1841 and was tireless in inculcating in his, his students with a deep sense of responsibility to marshal this tool in pursuit of the truth he believed nature to embody. That Eckersberg was an uncommonly persuasive instructor is evinced in the assiduity with which his priorities were carried out by his most uh, gifted students. Uh, Kleston Kupke is an example. Um, who provides a particularly uh, powerful example here in this picture. While this is ostensibly a simple and uncomplicated depiction of an average morning on the outskirts of Copenhagen, a uh, closer inspection reveals the considerable efforts that were required of Kupka to make it appear that way. Uh, Eckersberg's most broadly visible legacy is in the extraordinary perceptual clarity that Kupka achieves, even in figures and objects in the far recesses of pictorial space, and the tidy visual order with which they are presented. Underlying this order and lending the image an adamant stability is a thoroughly executed perspective system. Uh, the street stretching into the picture and out of view is at once the compositional device according to which all proportions are measured, uh, thereby reinforcing the image's realism uh, by providing a clear visual path for our imagined entry into pictorial space. And it is also a stage for the anecdotal content of the scene. The result is a scene that is inviting to the viewer in a very particular and careful way. In relatively few figural groupings here, Kupka provides a cross-section of the population and traffic one might regularly encounter on a morning to the northeast of Copenhagen. A group of fishermen's wives uh, on the left, uh, perhaps on their way to the Gammelstraten fish market in Copenhagen, uh, take a moment to rest on the sidewalk. In the street, uh, peasants dressed in their Sunday best are also on their way into town, uh, as a few cows mill around them. And on the far sidewalk, a group of bourgeois take a leisurely stroll. Uh, the, uh, Kupka has thus rendered an inviting view of a familiar environment that replicates for the viewer the easy legibility of familiar and orderly surroundings. It seems to me that what Eckersberg advocated and what his students practiced was a phenomenon widely discussed by aesthetic philosophers, particularly in Northern Europe in the Romantic period, a sort of emulating mechanism in the human psyche that had the capacity to record encountered stimuli and report them back in an enhanced or otherwise altered version. Uh, emulating because the mechanism did not simply function as a mirror. It was a locus of creativity. And to look at this a bit more closely, uh, I'd like to, to talk a little bit about this fellow, uh, Carl Gustav Karas. Um, in 1831, encouraged by his, uh, by his friend Goethe, I should say that Karas was an extraordinary figure in his own right. He was, he was a painter, he was a philosopher, he was a, he, he was a, uh, a medical scholar and a scholar of anatomy. He was one of these um, public intellectuals of the 19th century that make us all realize how little we've accomplished. Um, in, uh, in 1831, uh, encouraged by his friend Goethe to make his thoughts public, uh, Karas published a series of epistolary essays on art uh, under the title Nine, Nine Letters on Landscape Painting. Um, perhaps typically for a mind so widely curious as his, Karas is a little broad and loose in his terminology. Um, what I previously uh, offered as the emulating mechanism uh, appears in Karas variously as the spirit or the mind or the conscious or the unconscious, uh, depending on the function and context. Um, whatever he happens to call it, it is clear that he believes it to be at the heart of artistic creativity, most especially as applied to landscape painting. Uh, it is also absolutely central in the debate around the validity of landscape painting as a genre that raged from the late 18th century onward. Uh, very briefly, the argument was essentially between drawing, that is, the simple mechanical and literal reporting of a visual scene, uh, on the one hand, and painting, that is, the creation of a picture with a greater impact than the mere sum of its parts, on the other. In his fourth discourse on art in 1771, 
Sir Joshua Reynolds insisted that it was the responsibility of the artist not to record, but to improve on nature. Uh, Pierre-Henri de Valenciennes uh, added to this in around 1800, or in 1800, uh, with the observation that the improvement, the greater spiritual value in a landscape painting was necessarily the contribution of the artist's own mind. Uh, the emulating mechanism, if you will, which transcended simple vision. Um, this is where Karos entered the debate. Uh, and he did it by offering an extremely important observation. To begin with, Karos posited, as many others had, that the improvement in landscape painting to which Valenciennes referred constituted a glimpse into the soul and the spirit of nature. Uh, the best and highest use of art was to reveal the harmonic totality, the divine inspiration of the natural subject. Art, as Karas said, quote, brings to us the primal power and soul of the universe, which as a whole remains beyond human understanding and makes it known to us through one of its particles, close quote. Now here's the critical juncture. According to Karos, that particle of the universe, which indicates the harmonious whole, is the human mind itself. The reasoning is as follows. If the improvement to which Valenciennes, among, among many others, referred appears only when the visual facts of nature are processed through the emulating mechanism of the human mind, then it is the human mind that provides the transcendent quality in a landscape painting. And if the transcendent quality in a landscape painting is a reflection of the power and soul of the universe, then the human mind must a priori be in some sort of contact with that realm. Karos again, quote, the, the work of art must never adhere too closely to nature, but must rise above it. For if we ever forget that this is the work of the human spirit, art will lose its human reference, close quote. And again elsewhere, quote, the creations of art testify to the kinship between man and the spirit world, close quote. Uh, in this sense, the work of art also becomes the visual mode for communicating the artist's contact with the world, with the spirit, with the world's spirit or universe. And the human psyche in the observer, also capable of this contact, becomes the mechanism that receives it. Uh, there is one additional point to make here. Uh, insofar as the human mind is subject to moods, Karas explains, the work of art is also, quote, an utterance and a metaphor for the psychic state as a whole, which can truly hold a mirror up to the mind, close quote. And the observer, with a mind and psyche of his own, is equipped to receive this reflection intuitively without the need for concrete devices of explanation. The idea of human minds being in common contact with an abstract immaterial realm that allows them to communicate with each other on an abstract level remained in Karras's thoughts for several years. In 1846, he published a book further exploring this matter. Its title was simply Psyche, uh, and it is regarded as a forerunner of Freudian depth psychology. Uh, in his letters on landscape, Karras referred to the spiritual continuum of the universe. In Psyche, that continuum is the human unconscious. The unconscious is the basic life force, the animating principle, the steady and perpetual soul. Uh, moods, impulses, actions are all momentary manifestations of the conscious expressing the unconscious, just as a work of art was perceived as a particular objective manifestation of the universe. And again, people may communicate unconscious to unconscious, that is, in a sense, mind to mind. As literary critic George Gibeon has observed, quote, much of what we call magic, hypnotism, presentiment, is to Karas a mystery hidden only from the plodding intellect, but revealed to and, uh, and caused by reciprocal exchanges of influence between the unconscious of two persons or the consciousness of one person and the environment around him. Close quote. There is, however, one aspect of art as a mode of communication of some kind or other that Karas takes for granted and thus does not completely account for, and that is expectation. Um, Karas assumed, as virtually anyone would have done at that time, that the communication at hand would have been predicated on an unspoken agreement. 
a mutual understanding that the two minds in question shared a basic set of experiential parameters that would make communication natural. In the art of Eckersberg or Kripke or Lundby, uh, et cetera, the assumed parameters operated within two larger categories. The first was the memory of lived experiences and of the ethical and moral codes that romantic audiences associated with and ascribed to those experiences. Uh, the second level was the historical function of art and the conditions of legibility that had always governed it. If we take Karras' assumption of an unspoken agreement uh, that the two minds in question shared a basic set of experiential parameters that would make communication natural, then the dissolution or disruption of that arrangement, uh, of that agreement, might make for a rather unsettling example of uncanniness. Uh, incidentally, if you are on the outlook uh, for uncanniness, I have a dose of it for you here. All right, in that one. Um, I wanted to show you this work by a contemporary of Hammershoi's uh, and a phenomenal painter in his own right, uh, because it makes at once for an interesting illustration of Karras's shared unconscious and uh, a way in which it might, it might be, in a sense, perverted. Um, beyond the extraordinary visual achievement, the sheer paralyzing weight of the picture, a master stroke here, in my view, is the title. Uh, in whose eyes did who see death? Uh, is, it, is it he who saw death in someone else's eyes, or is it I who saw death in his? When I looked into his eyes and he into mine, did we see death in each other's eyes? Uh, the answer is yes to all of these, uh, just as sure as it may be no to any one of them. Um, the significance of Nielsen's title is that it immediately dissolves the subject-object split of identity. It's impossible to determine who is who. Uh, we can never know who the original I was, nor how many subsequent I's there have been. Uh, and autonomy is no longer relevant anyway, because we have entered another realm. The moment we read that title, we're no longer individual identities of the conscious. We are conduits of Kairos' collective unconscious, all connected to it and all resonating it in some way or other. The thing is, of course, that we survive the experience. We survive the encounter. Uh, as surely as Kairos believed that a painting was obliged to present a cohesive experiential moment, uh, a closed and discreet communication, uh, Nielsen, and for that matter, Hammershoi, knew that it could just as well be open-ended, uh, that it could be something else. Hammershoi, in his apartments, in town, and in the countryside, presents us with a world that doesn't quite make sense, uh, and that doesn't make itself available to us, doesn't resonate in the way that we are used to it doing. A world that should be hospitable is detached. A woman who should be in contact is profoundly alone. Giersing here was intentionally provocative when he issued this manifesto. Um, I think, I think Hammershoi's version would have sounded a little bit different. Uh, nature can be whatever it wants to be, and so can the image. And if that strikes you as uncanny, my guess is you'll probably get used to it. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so much. I should say that uh, Dr. Mednick is visiting uh, with us today from, from Toledo, Ohio. I should also suggest that it's a good moment for all of us to turn off our electronic devices in the event that we have not. Um, and uh, I would, it's now my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Susan Sidlauskas, uh, who's here today from Rutgers University. Um, her biography is fully printed out, and again, um, you, I invite you to, to look at that in the interest of time so we can go right to the speaker. But I do want to say that uh, one of the books that's mentioned in her biography, Body, Place, and Self in 19th Century Painting, um, is, uh, is one of the foundational uh, studies for us all to be really thinking about the mechanisms of interior painting, both in terms of its um, substance and structure and the haunted ways in which um, it's, uh, those images speak to us, familiar works which have become defamiliarized through her phenomenal scholarship, Dr. Sidlaskis.
Thanks, everybody. And Pat, thank you so much for inviting us and by giving us free reign. I hope you don't regret it at the end of the day. And of course, I have to have this picture in just about every talk I give, no matter what the topic is. Uh, this is Degas interior, as you see. Why do certain interior spaces elicit a desire to enter them, imaginatively, if not bodily, while others inspire us to back away, lest we lose our bearings? Some interiors manage to entice and repel simultaneously, stranding us somewhere between curiosity and the fear of what we might discover. For example, many have wondered what has transpired between the man and woman in Edgar Degas' painting, The Interior, which for many years was known as The Rape, as it still is on Wikipedia. I'm gonna see if I can do something about that. But to project ourselves into this setting would be to risk becoming embroiled in a tension potent enough to distend the floor, lower the ceiling, and push back the flowered wall. The force of this effect was produced through an uncommon interdependence of figure and ground. The woman's contracted form retreats along the perspective of the floor, while the shadow the man's body casts on the door reinforces his paralysis. Figure and space were shaped in concert with incremental adjustments made to each element of this interior and its occupants, all in the service of maximizing the psychological effect and confounding the na any narrative we may try to attach to it. Consider another Degas painting in which the space both billows out and collapses inward, leaving us uncertain as to whether this interior is a refuge or a trap. The title given this painting, The Nurse or Caretaker, seems wrong, for the woman tucked inside seems ill herself. Her head is wrapped, as were those of the invalid relatives whom Degas visited in New Orleans, the birthplace of his mother, Celestine, who had died when the painter was 12. The doorway does not simply bracket the so-called nurse, but actively exerts pressure on her, as if to ensure that she stays fixed in space, although where that is exactly is difficult to say. An expansive perspective is hinted at through the diagonals that reach towards the window below, but the ground before us rises up, suppressing those guides. Yet it seems certain that Degas wanted, us to, wanted to draw us close to this woman, for despite her recession in space, her face is unexpectedly detailed, jewel-like in its delicacy. The white scarf she wears may be a bandage, and the slash of white petticoat may be the hem of a convalescent robe. Both are irradiated by a pale but harsh light that filters through the Venetian blinds. She is cocooned in a dark, shapeless cloak that anchors her to the heaviest components of this ambiguous architecture. It's not just the russet paint smeared across the floor and the misshapen doorways that stop us from proceeding through the space. The most difficult feature to navigate and even to look at is the wall, a curious combination of squash yellow and aqua green streaks, stripes is too formal a term here, which radically destabilize the space. Black underpainting shows through in a number of places, particularly in the right foreground, where there may have been a low upholstered stool. I hope you can see that. This painting is usually at the Met now, although recently it was for sale, so I'm not sure what that means. A conspicuous, unmade bed, materialized into existence by dabs of frosty white, floats up as if to face us in your figural presence. This was a difficult time for Degas, a period of reflection on his lack of a family life, and thus far of his limited success as an artist, if you can believe that. Perhaps because of his acute isolation, he developed a keen attachment to his cousins, who had stayed in New Orleans throughout the years of the Civil War. He was especially drawn to Estelle, a sister-in-law who had been abandoned by Degas' brother, René. She was on the verge of going blind, a fate that Degas feared for himself, and one that he would have to encounter when he was much older. In the interior, a vulnerable woman was isolated by a disorienting architecture and her partner's withdrawal. Here we become the only witnesses to a solitude that is constructed as a kind of imprisonment. Degas' wildly painted wall anticipates by 20 years the surface that Edouard Vuillard would paint around and behind his sister Marie, who is pressed up against the teeming strokes of the wallpaper in a way that is pos positively menacing to her bodily integrity. Their mother, Madame Vuillard's blocky form anchors the space and is reiterated by the solidity of the chest behind her, although her face is a schematic waxen mask. The artist's sister is contained 
although, not, although less under siege, in another interior called the studio, or the suitor. I like that title better. Here, Marie is attending to the corset and dress business that her mother ran within the cramped Paris apartment they all shared. Vuillard's sister stands with her back to us, erect and graceful, regarding the figure whose form pierces the flowered wall. This is her fiancé, Pierre Xavier Roussel, happened to be her brother's best friend, a not unwelcome intruder into the world of women, but not someone who would stay, popping out as he does between the paper-thin planes of the wallpaper and the barely distinguished door, the thinnest of dividers between the domestic spaces that house this small family business and the disorderly impersonal streets outside. During the 19th century, painters, writers, playwrights, architects, and philosophers grew intensely preoccupied with the relation between the public and the private. Cities were bustling, crowds composed of different classes mingled on wide boulevards and in the new entertainment centers, and middle-class men and women wondered obsessively about the nature of the boundaries that separated them from each other, as well as those that distinguished their intimate spaces from the public domains they navigated with unprecedented freedom. Were those boundaries permanent or porous? How did one preserve one's private life amidst the demands of the city centers? And how were the spaces of transition and of contact identified and visualized? A question that is encapsulated in Adolf von Menzel's near fusion of her sister Emilie of her form with the architecture around her as she peeks around a door whose edge she seems unable to relinquish. Her tentative look outside suggests that the interior is composed of many shifting layers. In Madame Cezanne in the conservatory, the painter's wife, Hortense, is both attached to and marginalized by the family home. She is neither quite inside her mother-in-law's house, where she was not made to feel welcome, but neither is she released from its confines, tucked as she is inside the high wall of the family home's conservatory. Golden light transforms this adjunct space into something of a paradise, where each border between forms is breached. For instance, the tree emerges from the subject's right shoulder, her right shoulder on our left, only to pierce the wall like a skin. A number of modern painters, Degas, Fouillard, Menzel, and Cezanne among them, collectively invented a varied and dynamic spatial vocabulary during, the, during these years, a set of flexible structures that enabled new ways to envision and animate surfaces, boundaries, walls, and even windows, strategies that activate in us a particularly visceral mode of perception. In 1992, Anthony Vidler coined the term the architectural uncanny to characterize what he described as a domestic version of absolute terror fell keenly by the new middle class, which was, quote, not quite at home in its own home. Vidler was borrowing Freud's 99 idea of das Hamleich, I just, I'm not a Germanist, I'm so sorry. Uh, the uncanny, the unhomely, as, as Patton Troy expressed so much uh, better than me. The propensity, Thor, sorry, the propensity of the familiar to become strange. Vidler claimed that the spatial uncanny can occur even now in the empty, park, empty parking lots around abandoned or rundown shopping malls, which Vidler calls the wasted margins and surface appearances of post-industrial culture. Giovanni Piranese's prisons play a role in Vidler's formulation, with their unimaginable scale and seemingly infinite depths, all framed within a space that is impossible to exit, despite the multiple stairs and doorways we see. Henry James once described his friend John Singer Sargent's painting, The Daughters of Edward Darley Boyd, of 1882, as four corners and a void. And indeed, there is an interior abyss at the heart of its composition. The four sisters are positioned at varying distances from a darkness that seems fully capable of consuming the overscaled space in which they posed. The floors of this Parisian foyer, which is where they were, were made bare under sergeant's orders, for Ned Boyt, a talented watercolorist, preferred to cover every surface of, of his apartment, wherever he was living, with the thick silk and wool carpets he collected in his travels. His youngest daughter, Julia, age four, looks towards us, without reserve. The soles of her feet are spotless, as if they have never been soiled with the earthly activity of walking. Mary Louisa, on the far edge of girlhood, poses like a dancer and gravely meets our gaze. Florence and Jane in the shadows are, as John McCubrey once put it, lost in space. Jane occupies the center of this composition, yet her feet are barely visible, and her body looks uncomfortably clenched. 
Florence is averted from us, but seems equally disengaged from her sister. With her flattened bib, she is deprived of the feminine contour she was likely to have possessed at the age of nearly 15. And her face is schematic and incomplete, with a shadow for an eye socket and a triangle nose, the only discernible features. I'm sorry I don't have a detail, because I realize it's impossible to see. The enveloping darkness of this painting may have encapsulated something of the painter's own childhood. His expatriate family was forever on the move, but without the means to occupy a home of their own. And the possibility of death was ever present for the Sargent family, which had endured the loss of three very young children. It's also not impossible that the artist knew something that we didn't know until curator Eric Herschler of the MFA in Boston discovered it through historical records. Julia, Mary Louisa, Jane, and Florence had a brother who had been institutionalized from the age of nine, exiled from the house in which the rest of his family abided. A double portrait that Sargent painted three years later delivers a more equivocal interior. Robert Louis Stevenson, the writer, and his wife Fanny are pictured within the sitting room of their Burnmouth house on the south coast of England. The near skeletal but nonetheless animated figure of the author strides express expressively away from both his wife and the door that is opened between them. On the other hand, the figure of Fanny Stevenson has been almost dissolved by the costume in which Sargent painted her, which apparently she chose and put on, which is actually unusual for Sargent. He usually liked to control that. She was considered an exotic by Stevenson's suspicious friends. She was American. Worse, she was Californian. Even worse, divorced and a single mother. But although Fanny is conspicuous, wrapped in a gleaming sari and without shoes, or the sandals that might properly accompany such an ensemble, she is hardly the dominant motif here. While Robert, with his tall, thin frame and abrupt movements, certainly demands attention, our eye goes almost immediately to the open door that is planted between the two. A doorway, moreover, that opens into a dark, uncongenial hallway. Extricating oneself from the overheated parlor may have been desirable, but the door provides little reassurance that this is possible. The main reason for Fanny's lack of popularity among her husband's friends, with the exception of Henry James, who loved her, was that it was her job to keep them barricaded from his bedroom when he was in the throes of one of his lung hemorrhages, the likely tuberculosis that it would eventually take his life. Far too young. The hallway without a clear destination or point of egress is a darker variant of the view through the open door, which was a standard trope of historical genre painting, particularly cherished by Dutch 17th century artists. In Samuel Hoekstraten's view of an interior, often called slippers, the space seems to beckon us in successive stages. To enter it is to accept the invitation that is proffered by the key in the door and the wooden clogs at the threshold. Hoekstraten's work anticipates a kind of interior I'm a little nervous about saying anything about Hammershoi at this point, it anticipates a kind of interior that first became popular in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, a space void of figures that paradoxically seem so full of incident, of objects, of atmosphere, that there is no place left for us. This Wilhelm Hammershoi interior, and I, I thought that this was the uh, dust modes dancing in the sunbeams, is that title set aside sometimes? Okay. Um, is an exemplary work of this kind, in which the irradiated dust motes are treated as matter. It is as, as if to reach the light-filled window, we would need to endure the bombardment of thousands of infinitesimal par particles. This is not simply a space unpopulated, but one in which an absence is recast as a natural presence. In Menzel's famous balcony room, sun and light are made palpable by the wind that pushes against the curtain billowing in from the right. Because we can't actually see the view through the open door, our entry into the space is deferred. Pausing at the threshold, as we might do out of politeness, tends to activate a sensation of longing for that space, for it seems the perfect marriage of the interior and the natural world outside it. There is an ambitious watercolor by Cezanne called The Balcony, which at first seems to offer a similar conjunction of the perfect, the natural, and the constructed worlds. Here we are given no choice but to pause at the threshold. The painter was notoriously suspicious of both the obligations and the trappings of domestic life, which seemed to loom towards him as strange, unearthly beings. I just want to point out the additional leg on the chair, which he found no reason to cover up or change, uh, from whatever shelf or floor on which they were innocently planted. Most of the architectural structures Cezanne favored were marginal ones, an abandoned factory, um, an overgrown shack, a pigeon cove. His houses tend to be either uninhabitable or windowless, 
monoliths. Of course, you wouldn't want to live in the cracked house, but neither would you want to live on the ones on the right. Cezanne's son, Paul, at the age of six, took the liberty of correcting his father's vision of the houses in the distance when he added his own variation to the painter's sketchbook. You don't picture Cezanne letting his son draw in his sketchbook, but he did. Ultimately, the younger, Cezanne, the younger Paul decided to build a house that was all windows. I know, I just love that. In the balcony, Oh, and this is, uh, yes, I, I'm not at the balcony yet. Uh, Cezanne produced a scrim of luminous paint strokes, which you will see in seconds. A perforated wall situated where the formlessness of nature confronted the structure of the dwelling with greatest force. Or perhaps it was the reverse in Cezanne's case. The formless dwelling resisting the architecture of nature. Rather than envisioning an enclosure, an intimate space defined by walls, the banker, the banker, no, 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 he wasn't. The, his father was, but not him. The painter imagined a kind of membrane between the inside and the outside, suggesting that the boundary between self and world was both, in the words of anthropologist Paul Connerton, permeable and reversible. Cezanne has located us in a space we can neither leave nor remain in. There's no place for us to land. The absence of anchoring pushes us up directly against that scrim of color strokes. The view, which is what we assume this to be, seems transporting at first, an ethereal but potent evocation of nature without the distractions of identifiable forms, which the artist seems to have considered incorporating in this earlier study and chose to leave behind. There's another detail of this work at Princeton University, which is the reverse of another barely seen watercolor. But the elaborate, almost muscular coils of the ironwork impede a smooth passage through and out of the space, emitting as they do a sensation of accelerating movement only lightly contained. The railing seems a bit too low. We could topple right over it if we were so inclined. Are we inside or outside, Cezanne asks the question, here or there? How far away is the fabric of color, as Lawrence Gowing once called it, that seems somehow suspended in the air before us? How did the green of the tree seep in and then leak into the space beneath what seems to be a shutter? Metal shutters like these uh, were popular on middle upper middle class buildings in both Aix and Paris, would have been divided to allow either the upper or lower panels to open separately, a circulation of air necessary for the stifling heat of the south. But knowing this doesn't make the space any less ambiguous. The wall dissolves and the greenery presses inside as if no shutter can contain it. That rectangle of green and blue could be a separate work of art, as if Cezanne has framed one painting inside another. The longer we gaze at this bounded field of color, the more formless it appears. The strokes that comprise it grow more insistent, released from their presumed identity as trees or some sort of foliage gl glimpsed in the distance. Things are not as they seem and nothing stays where it belongs. There is some kind of physical encounter transpiring before us, however abstract its form. Cezanne teeters at the edge of his own threshold, or surrogate of his choice, poised between worlds, and we teeter along with him. By the early 20th century, the domestic interior as a figure for self was largely jettisoned with a preference for the artist's studio, a focus shared by both Picasso and an endless number of works right up until his death, and Henri Matisse, his great friend and rival. But the expressive interior seems to have returned with a vengeance within the past half century, in photography, film, and installation art in particular. The young photographer, Francesca Woodman, whose work I'm sure some of you know, experimented in the 1970s with domestic but abandoned spaces. In a series of photographs collected under the titles of Space and House, a figure, usually the artist herself, is seen virtually disappearing into the space between the wallpaper and the more permanent surface that is its foundation. It's as if Woodman had peeled back a layer of skin to reveal that there is indeed yet another space seen by no one else but her a space into which some fragment of herself may become entrapped or even seek refuge. There is a great uncertainty about where Woodman ends and the domestic structure begins, or whether she perceived that there was in fact a distinction. The idea that the very walls can threaten one's material existence had been suggested by Vuillard a century earlier, but without the self erasure that Woodman's work implies. Consider floor number seven and a half, the location for the Lester Corps filing company in Charlie Kaufman's film, Being John Malkovich, 1999. I hope many of you have seen it. Where the ceilings are four feet high and coworkers routinely crouch together for a friendly cup of coffee. Because the actors navigated their space with complete matter-of-factness, we began to doubt whether or not there really was anything off about those proportions, or was it just us? 
In the realm of photography, Jeff Wall's large Sebacombe print, which is usually up in MoMA, in homage to Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, locates the narrator in a subterranean lair on the edge of Harlem from which he tells his story. As an African-American man, he is invisible because people refuse to see him. Quote, unquote. Ellison. Wall is true to a key detail of Ellison's novel. The radiance in this underground room is generated by exactly 1,369 light bulbs, with free electricity provided unwittingly by the building's owner, who has no idea that this interst interstitial space even exists. We just had to have some Crudson, right? And this is new, newish. In a recent work by Gregory Crudson, which can be seen right now at the Gagosian Gallery in Chelsea, a woman sits on a bed which she does not seem capable of leaving. There is a haunting stillness in the room. The curtains are slack. The fan, I think that is a fan under the window, does not seem to be blowing. And the woman's arms are taut, her back stiff. The sliver of her body in the mirror seems to have captured an entirely different person inhabiting another space. Ordinarily, we assume that an interior is defined by its dependence upon a larger structure. Until 2012, that is, when the Japanese artist Tadzu Nishi built a living room around the 12-foot-high statue of Columbus that fittingly presides over Columbus Circle in New York. You see the structure he built around it. And now here's what it looked like inside. Viewers who were now through the magic of Nietzsche's structure, also visitors, had the uncanny experience of encountering the Colossus in their midst, up close and personal, while they sat comfortably in upholstered chairs chatting around the coffee tables. I wish I had seen this, but I, I didn't. Finally, there, is the install, there's, there are the installations of the Korean artist Do Ho Su, whose work can be thought of as a three-dimensional descendant of Cezanne's balcony. Doho Su implies a large number of seamstresses, mostly in Korea but also in New York, to help produce the pale gossamer nylon simulacra of the spaces he has occupied or admired and often left behind. Perfect Home is a ghostly impersonation of his former Brooklyn apartment with every single detail of its structure, including light switches and radiators, present and accounted for. When one walks with a perfect home, which one does when it's set up, the walls billow slightly, the floor wrinkles, and the ceiling rises and falls, as if the house itself is breathing. The shimmery fabric invites the viewer visitor to touch, much like the scrim of Cezanne's balcony did. We have, in principle, of course, been forbidden to touch either. With the perfect home, there would be a physical consequence even more immediate than the censure of the gallery attendant. The recognition that if we press our hands against the walls of this phantasmic house, they would meet with no resistance whatsoever, and the illusion of the wall would collapse. However, the resilient nylon fabric resists permanent damage, unlike its real-life counterpart in bricks and mortar, and reverts back to its own original form, much like Cezanne's watercolor scrim, no matter how many times we visually press up against it. The building of boundaries may be a primeval architectural act, as Paul Connerton has put it, but in Doho Su's structures, the surfaces refuse to rest in one place, and so with Cezanne. Thank you. Um, so we have two further speakers this afternoon. Our morning, uh, our morning, our earlier afternoon speakers brought uh, fundamentally different lenses onto the question of representation. And also, I think, in a very interesting way, the ways in which architecture and painted space and those things that fill painted space offer opportunities for our own bodies, uh, as well as our minds, to enter into a painting. And I think we're going to be receiving two further lenses onto those questions of representation and thought um, as we go further. Um, our next speaker is Ara Mirjian, who's here all the way from New York University. <laughs> Somehow the subway today was probably as challenging as Tor trying to come from Toledo. Um, again, um, Dr. Mirjian's biography is uh, indicated in the notes that you received, but I do uh, want to say that his extraordinary work on Giorgio de Chirico and his interest also in cinema and in narrative and philosophy have opened up ways in which we can think about representation and troubles the whole study of, of modernity. Uh, so with no further ado, I'd like to invite you to the stage. Thank you. Thank you to Pat for inviting me and to this distinguished company, and thank you for all for being here. Um, 
As you probably all know, um, or if you have any introduction to Hammershoi's work, you'll know that one of the names perennially brought up with regard to his is that of Giorgio de Chirico. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit today about um, how precisely that comparison or analogy obtains and what currency we might lend it. Um, De Chirico, as we'll see shortly, was constantly invoked as a painter singular in his own time in Paris on the eve of World War I, as a painter who miraculously somehow shrugged off the influence of his contemporaries during a time when attention was being paid more and more to painting as painting, to cubism pushing aesthetics to the edge of abstraction. De Chirico stayed stubbornly anchored in the figurative and even vaguely narrative world. And as we've already seen today, um, Hammershoi too, for all of his singularity as someone who is influenced greatly um, by contemporaries of his own period, as well as, um, as we've already seen, some of these slides will duplicate those of other colleagues before me, um, those who came before him. And one of the things that we can notice here that is a key difference between that of Hammershoi and his invocation, um, obliquely or not, uh, of Vermeer is the role that absence plays in his image. The idea of a vacancy being quite literally the central focus of this image and what that means for Hammershoi's painting as an art of subtraction. Um, De Chirico, for those of you who are not familiar with his work, is of Italian descent but was in fact born in Greece and raised in Greece until uh, his late teens. His father was a railway engineer who built the first railway between uh, Thessaly and Athens. And De Chirico, interestingly enough, was born in the port of Volos, which is ancient Iolchos, the port from which Jason and the Argonauts set sail in search of the mythical Golden Fleece. And this mythical narrative, like so many others, steeped De Chirico's private mental world from the time he was a child until he was an adult. And it is essentially grafted onto his vision of modernity and contemporaneity again and again. That which we see is at once a contemporary present world and somehow a simultaneous allusion to an archaic past, and oftentimes a pre-classical archaic past. We think of him as a neoclassical painter. He was anything but about the rationality and logic and sophrosyne of Periclean Athens. It was about a world prior to rational, rationality when the Greco-Roman world was steeped in mystery, myth, religion, and enigma. And as you can tell, with the idea of uh, a setting sail in this ancient galley, invoking not only um, the perspective of Quattrocento Italian painting, but like Hammershoi before him, interested more in veiling and occluding, um, both formally and in terms of meaning and narrative. Um, and this is something that um, obtains in the entire range of his painting, particularly those painted on the eve of World War I in Paris, where he really came into his own. Um, this is the period during which he invented the style of painting called metaphysical painting, which, as all of you who know De Chirico probably know is, and as I'll talk about as I conclude later, um, a forerunner um, of surrealist painting. He was later acclaimed by the surrealists as the godfather of surrealist painting. Um, Interestingly enough, for all the seemingly casual correspondence between Hammershoi and De Chirico, and oftentimes it is just that, merely a formal resonance, um, De Chirico had a very wide-rangingly um, Nordic influence upon his painting, um, stemming primarily from the fact that he studied for three years in Munich at the Academy of Fine Arts, but also, as we'll see, to a quite different imaginary apprenticeship. Um, the apprenticeship obtains in a number of paintings in and around, but never actually specifically identifying the city of Turin. Um, why is this? Um, it is because 
The philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche went mad in Turin after several years' residency there in 1888, penning on the eve of his death um, a number of his most clamorously acclaimed works, including Twilight of the Idols, Ecce Homo, The Case of Wagner, etc., etc. De Chirico actually, as this self-portrait from 1911 attests, believed himself to be the metempsychotic reincarnation of Nietzsche. Um, he believed, essentially, to channel um, Nietzsche's psychic and spiritual intuition into the world. We think of Nietzsche as um, the quoter of uh, not only God is dead, but the Ubermensch of, an, of the imposition of the will to power on the world. But uh, an entirely other dimension of Nietzsche's work, which offers, I might add, um, the sort of spiritual and intellectual uh, inheritance not only of deconstructionist leftist thought, but also, of course, at the same time for National Socialism and Mussolini, um, entirely capacious in its applications, was also the philosopher of myth, of poetry, and also uh, of silence. Um, it is the stillest words that bring on the storm. Thoughts that come on doves' feet guide the world. And I would just note um, briefly that Nietzsche's influence upon artists in the late 19th and early 20th century cannot be overestimated. He was, along with Henri Bergson um, and eventually um, later Freud, by far the most influential thinker upon the, uh, the general sort of approach to modernist art and literature that we can imagine. But unlike someone like Bergson, Nietzsche also had the personal pathos, the story behind it with which artists identified um, and in almost, at least, de Chirico's visceral sense, he also suffered, de Chirico suffered from um, stomach ailments um, and migraines, um, which, again, for him, for, provided further confirmation of his essential kinship intellectually with Nietzsche. And so just to give you a sense, um, just verbally, of his affirmation of this kinship um, with Nietzsche, uh, during a trip I made to Rome in October of 1909, when he first begins painting in this metaphysical style, after having read the words of Nietzsche, I became aware that there was a host of strange, unknown, solitary things which can be translated into painting. Again, a revelation can be born all of a sudden when one least expects it and also be stim stimulated by the sight of something, a building, a street, a garden, a square. In the first instance, it belongs to a class of strange sensations which I have observed in only one man, Nietzsche. And finally, to see everything, even man, in its quality of thing. This is the Nietzschean method. And so in what follows, what I want to suggest um, about uh, the resonance of Hammershoy, between Hammershoy and de Chirico is the precise nature of their silence. Um, de Chirico's, we should remember again and again, is a profoundly aristocratic and jealous silence. It is one that aims to speak to the very few. Um, de Chirico believed that his painting could communicate only with like-minded individuals who grasped the f profoundly Nietzschean, esoteric, and um, shall we say arcane and private um, gist of their imagery, even as they are, as you can tell, exceedingly public images. They literally take place again and again in the very quintessence of publicity, which is the square, the piazza, the place. Um, and they are, inf even as they are informed by everything from Greek and Roman mythology to Parisian modernity to the history of Italian painting to contemporary urban life, they are, as you can tell, evacuated into a complete and utter silence and stillness. So they are over-determined in terms of their origins and under-represented in terms of how they present that form. And that is, in a sense, what is Nietzschean about them. They guard jealously um, this very rich um, intellectual history and aim to communicate it only with a select few. Um, you can tell how even here um, you can see the ghostly spectral outline of what once provided um, a figure um, in the foreground. And uh, de Chirico's work is increasingly subtractive. It takes away more than it adds, which is, when we think about it, precisely how poetry works, right? Poetry acts parasitically on prose. It subtracts, it takes away, and it conjoins um, in having the absences and the gaps mean as much as the actual utterances. Um, 
Now, sometimes the affinity with Nietzsche proves almost literal, as when he depicts a horse in the foreground of one of these arcades, alluding to the instance um, that marked the, the, the dawn of Nietzsche's madness when he descended into the streets in Turin and clutched a horse as it was being beaten by its master. Um, but as we'll see, um, the, the meaning uh, is really the, the Nietzschean um, allusion um, is actually hammered home in much more subtle ways. And speaking of hammering, just to give you a sense of the utter um, association with silence, um, the pact with silence and with withholding that de Chirico's work reveals. This is by another Italian painter from 1914, the exact same year, Carlo Carrà, uh, involved with the Futurist group, who is obviously charging his painting with language, with the idea of a manifestation. It actually is meant to evoke a public manifestation in the Piazza del Duomo in Milan. Um, and hence, this affinity of painting with popular culture, with language, with an explosion of, of physical activism is precisely, as we can tell, the opposite of how de Chirico is approaching painting. And so two very different interpretations, if you will, of Nietzschean philosophy and what it meant to contemporary aesthetics. Now, for all of its seemingly mental, imaginary sense of space, de Chirico's paintings also responded to contemporary urbanism, particularly the, again, subtractive strategies of houseminization in Paris, whereby the prefect of the Seine, beginning in the mid to late 19th century, destroyed whole swaths of Paris in order to reorder it. And likewise, de Chirico's painting, as much as it is narrative and figurative, responds to contemporary examples in modernism as well. The way in which the floor rears up almost plumb with a picture plane in Cezanne, um, uh, the legacies of cubism as it's dawning in Paris at the same time, to which de Chirico is by no means immune, even as his painting seems to hold it at bay. The poet and critic Guillaume Apollinaire said that he was the only painter of the, his entire generation to essentially be spared the influence of the young French school. But of course, we can tell that that is actually um, not the case. He took as much as he gave. And as we can tell with the radically flat strip of yellow here, which seems almost as if it's cut and paste onto the canvas. And once again, like Hammershoy's image, making of absence the central presence of this painting. Um, the American critic Clement Greenberg once said with a great amount of cheek that it was not Dali who learned the greatest lesson from de Chirico, but in fact Mondrian. Um, and this goes a long way in illustrating the actual formal uh, resonance of de Chirico's works with those of his peers on the eve of World War I, rather than a later um, neoclassical figuration. And in fact, again, this is not so much of a stretch. Mondrian lived a few blocks from de Chirico in Paris, right around from the Gare Montparnasse, and he abstracted buildings um, to a similar degree. This is a building being demolished in probably what was one of the later examples of house minimization that he's abstracted into the series of um, uh, horizontal and geometric planes. Now, just to speak briefly to the Nordic influences of de Chirico's work, in addition to those of Nietzsche, Arnold Böcklin, uh, of the series of which we are, are blessed to have one example um, in the Met, there are a number of them. It was one of the most famous paintings in the 19th century, um, beloved by Freud and Hitler alike, um, the Isle of the Dead. Um, De Chirico literally cribs from Berklin's Odysseus and Calypso here in his Enigma of the Oracle from 1909. This is the start of his metaphysical style. You can tell that he's rendered Berklin in a much more architectural, geometric sense, but meant still to capture the sense of waiting, of um, mystery. This is a priest waiting for the revelation of the oracle in some unknown Mediterranean town um, on the coast uh, uh, of some shore. Um, and here we get a sense the extent to which de Chirico is wanting to evoke not the sense of uh, Athens um, in its classical, logical, rational inheritance, but in fact this pre-Socratic, a uh, pre-classical realm in which uh, philosophy was as much about myth as it was about science and reason. And here, 
as you can tell, five years later, de Chirico in Paris painting mere shop window mannequins as if they are prophets, you get a bit of what I was saying about this grafting of the uh, archaic past onto modernity. We have the same um, concealing curtain here and veiling, um, and instead of an actual priest, we have an everyday shop window dummy. Um, interestingly, however, uh, his gaze um, and this is something that could have been seen as you, again, on the streets of Paris. So his invocation of the past is always at the same time inflected by modernity. Um, his gaze, as it looks at this chalkboard, um, reveals not only the spectral architectural diagram and hence a seer, a visionary into the world as we cannot grasp it, but also the word Turin, again alluding to Nietzsche's madness. Um, so how, how am I doing on time? About how much? Okay. Um, a few more minutes. So uh, here we get the sense of de Chirico in Paris looking at an ordinary shop window and evoking it as a site, again, of enigma, of mystery. Um, is this, are these toys as they would be seen by a child? Are they scientific instruments? Are they, um, as the, the art historian and MoMA curator James Thralsobi once thought, um, uh, party favors? Um, <laughs> Are they uh, organs laid out on a sacrificial altar? They are, at the same time, all of them. And here, de Chirico has done away with the notion, the physical sense of an altar or an oracle, and placed us as if we are the priest um, in front of this altar here. We are the ones now ordaining its meaning and reading its enigmas, reading meaning into these enigmas. And again, um, it, it's not without its art historical illusions, even as he's covered them up. This painting hung in the Louvre at the time that de Chirico is living in Paris on the eve of World War I, and he's obviously cribbing this clock, which is what it was, um, from Holbein, the same kind of clock and uh, orological and nautical instruments that appear in Holbein's, Holbein's The Ambassadors, about which we heard earlier. And so this idea of uh, the consummate tools of European reason and rationalism are in fact invoked as something irrational, something perhaps even vaguely erotic, nonsensical. This, uh, as far as we know, derives to some extent from an Egyptian sun clock. Um, and this central object here is derived from a gnomon, which is an ancient, essentially, sundial. And so he's turned the city at large into a time delling device, but one that is not precise like the integers of Kratzer's clock, but rather bound up with things like shadows. And de Chirico once said, there is more mystery in the shadow of a man than all of the religions on the earth. And to hammer home this notion of the integers and geometries of Western reason being shot through with mystery um, and even, to a sense, foreboding, the painting uh, alludes at the same time to a divining tool by ancient Etruscan priests who would use these augurs, the sheeps of liver, um, the, excuse me, the livers of sheep, um, to read the stars. Um, this is actually a teaching tool whereby a, an ancient augur, an Etruscan augur, would actually show his apprentices how to read the future into the livers of sheep, depending on what bulbous um, uh, protuberances there were. These were essentially, and this is written in Etruscan language, mapped up with the stars. So this is a kind of mini cosmogony where we read in Nuce the future. Um, and so, and here, this is from the Vatican, an ancient priest here um, from, uh, from Homer's Odyssey reading um, the future into one of these livers. We, all, we have, um, on certain Etruscan tombs, individuals grasping. This is actually um, from the Archaeological Museum in Athens. Um, so these objects here are being evoked as at once about reason and something entirely different. Um, and just getting towards the conclusion here to think of thinking of Hammershoy as the painter of tranquil interiors. Well, like Hammershoy's paintings, de Chirico's interiors are oftentimes, their tranquility is shot through with something different and vaguely unsettling. Um, even this still life from 1919, where he, we're coming to the end of his metaphysical period, is perhaps not an entirely domestic, tranquil interior, for we see the faint dawning of a horizon at the far edge of this table's top. Um, 
which is itself recalling things that would sit in a city square. Um, and as much as it's recalling um, the Dutch golden age of still life, it's alluding to something um, uh, perhaps disturbing at the same time. De Chirico eventually became interested not only with his imagery, but with the material presence of painting itself, stretchers, pieces of wood, frames. And here we get a sense in Nuce, if you remember one painting to help you think about what metaphysical painting is, it's that de Chirico painting at this piece of wood block as the fundamental element, the fundamental sense of mystery, that the metaphysical, the strange, the mysterious is not to be found in outer space, in twilight, in everything, all of these romantic commonplaces that we think about the strange and the unsure. It's in the very, the most certain building blocks of material reality. And here we have his spectral doppelganger gesturing out the window, right? So even in an ordinary block of wood is something strange, mysterious, potentially even unsettling. Um, and keep in mind that, you know, de Chirico's paintings are all about um, daytime rather than night. And so just looking at these last interiors, which he turned to as of 1916, um, after uh, 1915, after he moves to Ferrara during World War I, um, here we have a sense of the interior as a site of mental travel and adventure. Um, people have always read these paintings as claustrophobic, but they're in fact actually entirely claustrophilic. Um, he's thinking about um, Jules Verne and, ha and the armchair adventurer, um, and even replicating this idea, these, um, these tools of Verne's, um, these nautical tools as a site of uh, uh, of uh, as much of mental travel um, as an actual um, steamship. Um, and this inversion, right, of the interior as not an interior um, is something that uh, is also particular to this period of de Chirico's interiors. And um, I know that I'm sort of running out of time, so I just wanted to end um, uh, one interesting thing that happens with de Chirico's paintings is it gets really read in terms of, um, of the, the crime novel and the detective novel, um, and he's actually referring to them at the same time. I just wanted to, to end with uh, um, a few of the, the images um, that Hammershoy, perhaps not through de Chirico, but even in, in, um, independently anticipated about the, the certain trends in art history and modernism um, that come after de Chirico, particularly surrealism um, and even other contemporary um, elements. Um, you know, when Tanning, when Dorothea Tanning, a prominent American surrealist, um, is obsessing about the, the mental compartments of um, uh, opened up in perpetuum, a kind of um, labyrinth. I think, to some extent, it's of, of uh, to Hammershoy's work, obliquely or not, that she is um, responding. Um, we might think of Wyeth um, and some of his own inheritors as um, responding um, to Hammershoy, including James Welling, um, Josephine Halverson, um, and uh, the Spanish painter and draftsman Antonio Lopez Garcia um, in the same vein. So thank you very much. Thank you for that fabulous lecture. I'm so sorry it got cut off. So you, we've, got, we've got more opportunity for discussion. So these ideas of... Um, as Margaret Carroll brought up, sort of haptic viewing, or there's literary viewing, there's the notion of claustrophilia that you've <clears throat> just introduced. Um, a number of strangely vectored ideas into and through Hammershoy's work to help us to see that work freshly and through lenses that we had not necessarily anticipated as audiences of this exhibition, but that help us to see freshly. And our final speaker um, for today, um, is Dr. Gail Levin, who is a wor the world's authority on the art of um, Edward Hopper. All the way through the symposium, the speakers have brought um, expertise on artists to whom uh, Hammershaw has always been um, associated. 
And through the uh, careful and close looking of those artists at Rembrandt or at Degas or at uh, Cezanne, at Hammersoy himself, at de Chirico, we begin to tease out some similarities, some differences, some shared ideas around um, text and viewing and meaning. And when it comes to um, Edward Hopper, I think that we're in an arena where Hammershoi is always, uh, or Hopper's always invoked in the Hammershoi material, but never with uh, the same kind of depth of explanation that, that we really need to understand it. So we have Dr. Levin here uh, to help us to see uh, freshly in that arena. And again, you have her biography uh, noted in your handout. The one thing I would like to um, push upon is the fact that despite the fact that she has done extraordinary work um, on Hopper and on, another, on a number of American uh, uh, sort of canonical painters, she's also made an immense effort and had a huge impact in her career on the study of women <laughs> artists as well. So opening up um, other canons for us. So Dr. Levin, I'd like to invite you up here. Thank you. Okay, so Edward Hopper's interiors, a look inside. There we go. Um, and thank you, Aura, for, um, and uh, Margaret, for um, De Chirico and Rembrandt, who relate to my talk, uh, and also Susan for Degas, who relates to my talk. And I want to say, first off, that um, Hopper is so often compared to, uh, that is, people are dying, but maybe because Hopper is American and American art was so late to be appreciated, that is, outside of the United States, that would be after World War II. Um, so when Hopper showed at the Vienna, Venice, Biennale, Venice Biennale, I believe in 1956, he was called an American de Chirico. And I don't think that it's um, influence at all, nor do I think that Hammershoi influenced Hopper, although I'm, the jury is still out if we can find when Hopper could have seen Hammershoi. Um, and there is the question of if he saw the Scandinavian painting exhibition in New York in 1912, and then exactly what was in it. But I think we are dealing more with the situation of mutual influences um, or artists that are on the same wavelength. Um, even um, this enthusiasm, for example, for uh, Degas, for Rembrandt, which Hopper certainly shared. But when you look at Hammershoi's interior uh, here and in the exhibition, you've already seen the um, extraordinarily um, interesting relationship to Hopper's room, much later, of course, room in Brooklyn from 1932. And the back view is just not that common, the back portrait from the back, although they do exist across the history of art. And of course, there is the animating sunlight coming into the room, which, as you've seen, is true in German Romanticism as well, which um, Hopper did, um, well, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself, but he, he did get to Europe, but there's a question whether he could have seen Hammershoi in Europe, for example. I can't pin it down, and he certainly never mentioned him. But while he did uh, wax enthusiastic about Rembrandt, about Degas, for example, th that's a very well documented, um, his interest in both of those European masters. In fact, Hopper, who first went to Europe in 1906 and came back, and uh, that's the fall of 06, and came back in June 1907, uh, going back to Europe two more times, the last time in 1910, he said, he complained. He said, it took me 10 years to get over Europe. So, um, But the beam of light, of sunlight, Hopper did 
comment late in life, and of course his wife, the artist Josephine Nivison, was writing quite a lot down in her diaries. And for Hopper, for example, when their caretaker on Cape Cod died, Hopper's comment was, poor Tommy Gray, he can't see the sunlight anymore. And so sunlight for Hopper was really the animating life force, and maybe for Hammershoy as well. So here you have Hopper in Paris on that first trip in 1906-7. I think it's springtime already. And he was really open to, he was there to absorb European art. Um, and, but uh, I can't find Hammershoy. I can find, uh, he went to the Salon de Tom, he saw certainly Cezanne. And yet we have these very um, provocative images with the, the beam of sunlight that even late in Hopper's career in 1963, the sun in an empty room. And it is the sunlight as the animating life force. So there is this provocative association. However, Hopper, as I mentioned, um, well, like Hammershoy, was uh, married. But Hopper's spouse was very garrulous and an artist, Josephine Verstil Nivison Hopper, an artist, I might add, that he tried to suppress from being an artist as soon as they got married in 1924. And uh, despite the fact that she had gotten him into the show she had been invited to be in at the Brooklyn Museum that launched his career, and he um, received the purchase prize from that show of watercolors. So, this now is, they met in art school, but they weren't an item. So Hopper and Joe left, uh, Edward and Joe left art school in 1906, and they're not courting until 1923, although they ran into each other right after he did this etching uh, and was the next summer in Monhegan Island, where, um, and also they ran into each other earlier on, um, in Agunquit, Maine, all the summer artist colonies where artists went to work, paint in the summer. But um, Joe commented that Hopper had great dancing legs, but he didn't dance. So uh, if you can imagine this garrulous, um, very energetic wife-to-be, or wife for 43 years of Edward Hopper, and this morose, depressed um, introvert, uh, you can imagine the tension, especially since she was determined to be an artist and he was determined to stop her and all women from being artists. So here we see uh, an interior, but it's a train interior, and it's not a daytime scene, it's a nighttime scene. It's night on the L train, the elevated train in New York, but you have a lot of emotional stress and tension between the two figures which often animates Hopper's interiors. So there you see um, the intensity of the figures in this detail. This is an etching, of course, which is the only thing Hopper could sell before Joe got him in that 1923 watercolor show. That and his commercial work of illustration. But Hopper's, Hopper's interiors um, from before he married, uh, are probably based on observation of his only sister, two years older than him, uh, one Marion Hopper, and his mother. Um, so he liked to paint and depict in his etching a woman at a sewing machine. And I think to understand Hopper's interiors, we need to remember that he's born in 1882, that he grew up in a conservative community, Nyack, New York, small town, um, in the shadow of uh, his family's membership in the, a very uh, conservative Baptist church. And women uh, could only go out then with chaperones. And being at home in an interior and, and being engaged with a domestic practice like sewing, that was just fine. So that's what we see here. But we also see that animating sunlight. 
Uh, this one is from 1921, again, before Edward and Joe got together. So it's either a model or it could be his sister. It looks a lot like the family home. Uh, in Nyack, it's called New York Interior from 1921. And it's a portrait from the back, which if you don't like to do faces, good way to go. Uh, after Joe and Edward get married, they go out to New Mexico uh, for a sort of belated honeymoon. That's a long story. But when they, by the time they come back, Edward has discovered uh, that he no longer has to pay 25 cents an hour to observe a life model at the Whitney Studio Club because he has a woman who is a trained actress who's acted with Washington Square players as a wife. So why pay for what you can get for free? And so this is one of the earliest, perhaps the first de depiction of Joe modeling for a figure in the interior. It's not quite a back view, but we don't see her face, so maybe just a snitch of the nose. And we do see the sunlight coming in through the window. Uh, I don't think it's uncanny, but it's certainly silent. However, their relationship was anything but silent. There can be no denying the impact of biography because Hopper left not diaries, but caricatures that he made of his wife, Jo. And when he married her, she was not living alone, but with Arthur, her alley cat. Only way they got off for that trip to New Mexico is that Arthur disappeared. He was jealous. Edward didn't like him. He was jealous. There was a rivalry between Arthur and Edward. <laughs> and this is how Edward saw marriage when they first got together. And I would suggest to you that this is a hopper interior. <laughs> and so are these. Meal time and the sacrament of sex female version in which Edward shows himself wearing a nightshirt and a halo as he bows down in ritual and mealtime. Joe, ah, Joe is reading, and that recalls the women in Hammershoy's paintings. And I believe his wife was also a model, but I don't know if she had the same spunk and, and stress on the relationship that Joe put on Edward. And uh, we don't know how Edward managed to eat before they married, but this is his version of mealtime. OK, uh, Joe, so is the model for all of these silent interiors, the woman in Automat from 1927. And here you see in Tables for Ladies from 1930 in the Metropolitan Museum, its roots in Dutch painting in Franz Hals with the meat as um, evocative symbol, uh, erotic symbol. Uh, they are the chops, the, you know the expression to lick one's chops. But look at the checkerboard floor, it, and uh, it come, the, the woodwork comes right out of a Jan Steen uh, Dutch 17th century painting that Edward knew well, right at the Met. And uh, again, this changing role of women is very central to Hopper's interiors and his relationship with his wife. He married a contemporary less than a year younger, but she turned out not to be the Victorian woman of his dreams, but the new woman of Greenwich Village. And so he's painting the restaurant that is at the Met, and it's called Tables for Ladies, which baffled me and every other critic for many years until I came across evidence in a flea market of this World War I soldier with a restaurant billboard pointing to tables for ladies. And through interviews, I learned also with old people what those were. In other words, women, remember, had to go out chaperoned or be thought ill of uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. And so by 1930, there began to be restaurants where women could go out, ladies could go out two at a time, say, without a chaperone and not be perceived as prostitutes. And I can remember actually traveling as curator of the Hopper Collection for the Whitney in the Midwest 
and still being treated that way, being sat in the dark shadows by the kitchen door because I was a woman alone. But there's tables for ladies. And so hotel room in 1931, another woman reading, but this time a letter. I want to zip ahead here. And you see the relationship. That is one of Edward Hopper's uh, last illustrations from Scribner's Magazine on the right. Uh, commercial work that he detested doing, but it has a distinct relationship to his stripped down interiors uh, that appear in his interior paintings. And a painting like Room in New York, which has its Hitchcock, oh, thank you for the Hitchcock as well. It has that sense of Alfred Hitchcock's uh, rear window, and Hopper was a major fan of the cinema. But he also is looking at Vermeer, a painting like Officer with Laughing Girl, uh, the couple in the interior, and the negotiation that goes on. And I don't know that it's uncanny, but he's ignoring her in the hopper. She's about to disturb his concentration reading the newspaper by playing on the piano. If we look at Office at Night by Hopper in 1940, here on your left, uh, Hopper would only talk about the three sources of light overhead from the window and the desk light. But um, he was very interested in Degas, so much so that Joe gave him a very wonderful monograph on Degas when they were just getting married. But look at the cotton market, an American scene painting by Degas when he visited New Orleans. And look at the window, the angle, the angle of the floor. And actually, if I would show you the sketches for Office at Night, you would see that the chair uh, was originally, from the lower left corner, was originally in the sketch. And it looked too much like Degas. Hopper erased it. And actually, the interior at the top the a mysterious man, actually you're gonna see that he becomes the posture of Joe when she poses as the board usherette in New York movie. But here again, the Quentin Metzies, the money, ch money changer, the couple in the office. Again, a Northern, Hopper is much more Northern, apologies to, um, Italian painting and De Chirico, but Hopper is much more linked to northern uh, artistic sources. Oh, and this is from Edward Hopper's commercial illustrations, 1916, for precursor of Business Week magazine. That is how he was supporting himself when he took up with Josephine Nivison. And here we have another interior, and this one very interesting because painted years after he's moved out of the family home in Nyack, but his sister still lived there. And this is uh, the actual stairway, but it already appears in, in this detail from a sketch when he's just graduating from high school. And he shows himself going out into the cold world in his cap and gown, but there in the distance, the mountain is labeled fame. There can be no question of what he was after. This is um, an important interior. It is, uh, actually, if you look at the photographs, I didn't bring it, I think, in my book, Hopper's Places, this is based on his own studio overlooking Cape Cod Bay in South Truro. It's called Rooms by the Sea from 1951, but again, it's that bolt of sunlight so close to what we see in Hammersoy. Uh, and we have it again in Hotel by the Railroad, along with the woman reading, but Joe's comment and the record books that she kept of Edward's work, he'd better keep an eye, um, she'd better keep an eye on her husband, he wishes he were somewhere else. So we have some clues. I'm not just guessing. Uh, this is Arnold Newman's photograph of the house that you just saw. The rooms by the sea is the one looking out over the bay. That's Joe in the background. Arnold Newman said to me, 
I kept trying to take this picture and Joe kept getting into it. So. That's Joe in front of the, that's Joe out in California when they went to the Huntington Hartford Foundation in 1957, Western Motel, uh, again an interior with a view out. Um, this is Joe in front of that big studio window in the South Truro house I just showed you. Joe as an artist, Joe sketching in 1938. Uh, there they are, and that's another interior. I'm not showing you the painting, but those are the record books Joe kept. That's a 1965 page for the interior of a late train painting, the um, penultimate hopper painting called Share Car. And this is, of course, also an interior, his best-known painting, Nighthawks, painted uh, at the time uh, at, right after Pearl Harbor, uh, when there's a sense of unease out in the night. And it's both an interior, but viewed from outside. So we see exterior and interior. Hotel lobby, again. Uh, lot going on here, and the woman reading, ever-present. I think Jo must have been a fairly bored model. She had to do it a lot, and she loved to read, as you saw in the caricature, so that's how the woman appears often. This is 1943. The tilted floor is Degas all over again. Summer in the City, so the couple paintings from 1949, the incredible beams of sunlight, those reminiscent, of course, of Hammerskoy again, but the couple, not the tender couple of Rembrandt's The Jewish Bride, no. More like Rembrandt's St. Paul in prison. I'll let you decide which one is in prison. But Hopper had books of Rembrandt, as he did of Degas. There's the New York movie interior. And um, that's Joe in the pose of the man in the interior that I showed you by Degas from 1939. Uh, she actually, this scene appears in um, Herbert Ross's film with Steve Martin and Bernadette Peters called Pennies from Heaven. This painting actually becomes a scene in that film. And that's one of 50 sketches of Joe posing for the board. Uh, for the, Joe posing for the board usherette is one of 50 studies that Hopper did for this painting, which he went to more than five theaters. So it becomes the quintessence of movie theater interior. Another couple painting, uh, Excursion into Philosophy from 1959. There's that wonderful sunlight beam on the floor and the book she's put down or he's put it down because actually the comment in the record book is he's been reading Plato rather late in life. <laughs> and there they are in Hans Namuth photographs in the house in South Truro in front of the big window that was Edward's studio. Joe was free to paint in either of the two other rooms where the light was impossible, the bedroom or the kitchen. And there he is working on one of his last interiors, Sun in an Empty Room, with Joe in the background, uh, trying to get into the picture again. And this one, A Woman in the Sun, and John Clancy, Hopper's dealer, uh, asked him, Joe was then 78 years old, and he said, why, Mr. Hopper, who's the model? And Edward replied, why, that's Joe, glorified by art. <laughs> we have the view out into the landscape and the beam of light on the floor. Um, did I run out of time? Oh, I should sum up. <laughs> well, maybe I'll leave it for discussion. Um, I'll sum up. So I think 
I bear the burden of being both the author of the catalog raisonne of Hopper and his biographer. And I know quite a lot of what went on in his life, thanks to his wife's diaries, at least from her point of view, maybe more than he knew or cared to remember. I cannot escape the biographical element uh, that animates Hopper's interiors. Um, the lonely aspect, Hopper had a comment himself, he was asked about it by the critic Catherine Koo, and he said, she asked him about the loneliness. He said, oh, the loneliness thing, it's overdone. <laughs> and you know, he was uh, an introvert by choice. So um, married to somebody buzzing around all the time, they saw each other 24 seven. As you see them here, she's always there. And he had an actress wife, a willing model, even though she was also an artist in painting, the only tension was he tried to get her to stop being an artist. And that tension, I think, uh, she couldn't really forgive him, even though she thought he was the, um, certainly America's greatest artist and a great world painter. But that tension between them figures in Hopper's interiors. I don't know if I would call it uncanny, but I certainly would call it tension. Thank you. Well, it's been a long afternoon with many, many parts, including the diaphanous uh, 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 constructions of Doho Su and uh, the cultural politics of atrocity, everything in the middle, from uh, marriage, marital tensions and the biographic, in a sense, the biographical, which is often attached to Hammershoi's work, um, philosophical uh, propositions about potential parallel universes. So there's a lot to chew over, a great variety. Um, I'm first wondering if there are any questions or comments that the speakers have for one another. Um, <laughs> Never at a loss for words. Never at a loss for words, um, I um, Just starting with your remarks, Pat, which I thought were superb. Uh, one of the things that struck me um, uh, was when you were talking about the uncanniness of that um, ceramic vessel at the back of the, of the room, because that was in sharp focus and the things in front were soft. When I remembered in the ancient days studying Vermeer and people explaining focal points of cameras, it wasn't that unusual for something to be sharp at the back if that's where you set the focal point. So my question is, is it necessarily uncanny if that's, or to put it differently, do you think he ever worked with photographs or photographic apparatuses or anything like that? Yes. Yes. Extension. Short and sweet. Um, yeah. Short and sweet, yes. Yeah. Okay. And the playful, I think, I hand it to you well, to talk about it, but the playfulness with d distance, I think that the, the issue of physical proximity and distance and projecting oneself into the space we is extremely, yeah. I think it's mm -hmm. really complicated. And yeah. I think in different ways you've each talked about how uh, the audience uh, inhabits or is precluded from inhabiting a space. And I think that that, uh, that trick both is a very ambivalent one. And I think the theme of ambivalence comes up a lot mm -hmm. in, in what you've all, ambivalence not meaning a lack of interest, but to oppositional forces that, that intersect in curious ways. I think that that's a device of ambivalence for sight, but. Yeah, I agree, yeah. And I, there's also, he, he, did, um, he did use uh, photographs, but there's very little consistency in the way that he used them. He, mm -hmm. uh, that is, he, um, uh, he sometimes used them as a sort of uh, construction for the overall presentation, but then he also could use them in a sort of collage sense, that is, uh, hmm. photographic elements inserted into an otherwise unphotographically rendered picture. Did Hammerskoy um, know the work of Eugène Ache? Uh, did he? Because Edward Hopper liked those, so they may have just had similar sources, yeah. including Degas. He also, I mean, he also took a fair number of his own photographs. Uh, <coughs> as, uh, the, the painting that you showed of the 
the end photo too, uh, was based on a series of photographs that he took himself, just at the moment, just outside the door. Mm. Yeah. Well, Certainly. <laughs> uh, Gail, something struck me as you were speaking too about if if uh, Hopper returned to the U.S. in 1907, in June of 1907, could is it possibly saw the Hammershoi show in London, the big Danish show in London, what or Hammershoi? Was was there was a there was a large exhibition of Danish paintings in London yeah. in 1907 at the and Haywood, right? at the Haywood. Yeah. And Hammershoi was kind of singled out by critics as being the cult, so-called strangest, most yeah. um, ha uh, not haunting. I forgot that somebody out there might know it. But so it's possible. But what month was it? That's what we have to look into. It was, I think, I in the spring. We're going to look that he up. Went yeah. to the we're going to put a footnote in it. No, we'll it talk. Yeah, but it's it's it's. But it would have been after the spring, wouldn't it? Because spring was the Academy show. To be, to be determined. Yeah, we'll see. We'll figure it out. I have, a, I have a question just for everyone in general, and even perhaps as a way to open it up to the audience. To what extent, um, I mean, re, I think there's an extent to which we read back into Hammershoi's work uh, an aesthetic, a formal aesthetic that's also necessarily an existential one um, from you know the, the cinema of, of Michelangelo Antonioni to, to Rothko's paintings um, to De Chirico and Hopper. Um, to the sense of a kind of urban uh, stimmung or environment of kind of alienation and estrangement. To what extent do we think that those paintings, that these paintings are really of a particularly modern um, sense of alienation and estrangement? And to what extent do they belong to something else, to another? Um, I mean, are we projecting our own sense of modern 20th century estrangement back onto those, the spareness of those images. Um, that's something that perhaps Tor, Tor and, um, and Pat might be able to help uh, us think about, but um, yeah, I'm, just, I'm not sure. Well, I, uh, it's not that I don't uh, care to participate, but there's no way to answer that satisfactorily. Um, it's, uh, it's certainly, I can tell you that if you, uh, if you read through the scholarship on him, <laughs> Um, until recently, anyway. So, if you if 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 you had been if you've read stuff that was published twenty years or more ago, all of it was projection of some kind or other, and there were discussions of you know crystallization uh, as as related to alienation, as related to you know moments moments frozen in time and therefore out of time, and there was a tremendous catalog of psychological and biographical readings and so forth. The trouble is that uh, he didn't leave any statements of his own. Uh, in fact, he ordered everything to be burned on his death. Um, yeah. Did, did yeah, people comply? But I mean, it's, it could Was also it be suggestive burned? of someone who simply wishes to have his, uh, please mind your own business. You know, I mean, That's very a, alienated. Yeah. <laughs> Except for interviews with a shelter magazine. Right. That's right. Yeah. There were there were interviews, yeah, and then his well, mother kept a scrapbook. How right? about his interest in Strindberg and Ibsen, um, which Hopper certainly had an interest in Ibsen. Right, and I I I I don't know. I haven't seen that described or discussed. I mean, this I mean, is it's the kind of hard to imagine a Scandinavian artist that wouldn't be interested in <laughs> Ibsen and Strindberg. Yeah, I'm from or that aware period. anyway. Yeah. Well, there right. were Ibsen clubs worldwide. I mean, literally clubs, yeah. um, and so I would say, sort of, as you had said about Nietzsche, it was really hard, not just in the Nordic countries, but I think for uh, for literary people in general around the turn of the century to have avoided Ibsen in one way or another. Ibsen was, a really was character. very big in New York and at the New York School of Art with the teacher Robert Henry Hopper's favorite teacher. All those students were sent out to see Ibsen. One of the things that. Uh, that that also makes it has made it easy historically for scholars to talk about Hammersoy in the context of alienation is the fact uh, that he um, that he did sort of project an isolationist attitude toward himself and he didn't really leave any information and so it's handy to allow that to translate into an attitude where he has nothing to do with anything. Um, it's not clear that that's true. He traveled a lot, he exhibited a lot, and he had a circle of friends with whom he was engaged. And so, it, it, but it, it's um, it's absolutely uh, a relevant question that really can't be answered. You know? In the case of Sargent, for instance, he's someone that completely defies our attempt 
to extract any sense of alienation right. or, from his own life. Yeah. He, and he said nothing about these things that he felt or thought. I mean, we know the biography of his family. Yeah. But that's a, it's a tricky thing. Yeah. So, I mean, even talking about the Boyds and talking about Erica Herschler's discovery about the missing son. Yeah, right. That was right. like, whoa. Yeah. That was, that was like a big bombshell. Yeah, in, in a, right. Uh, but, but does it change the painting? Should we allow it to? Should we not? If it's not projection and alienation, what else? What are the other mechanisms for responding to these works? Right. I, I, a, I'm wondering. Well, so one, I, right. I mean, and that's the big question. And so one, I mean, one way that Pat and I have, have and, and some others have gone about it, is trying to look uh, structurally uh, mm. And trying also to look at um, uh, influences that are clearly there, no matter what he may have thought of them. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I mean that 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 the the resonance of the Dutch and Danish golden ages is there, and so then you can start to look at one what one might expect from from a painting that referred to those, and realize that he's actually evacuating a lot of the stuff that you would expect from those, and maybe that's the statement. You know, so mm -hmm. it, it it's more about. Um, it's sort of, to the extent that it can be, a fundamentally object-based approach. I mean, unless you want to go with the projectionist approach, which is not something that hasn't really resonated with Pat and me mm -hmm. and, and, and some of the newer people looking at this stuff, um, I'm, I'm not really all that concerned about what his psychological state was. Mm -hmm. And part of that is not because, it's not that I don't care about psychological states. Uh, there are people who I'm interested in, you know. But um, it's... Uh, it's it's not determinable, you know. I would have to say the same thing about Sargent. Yeah, right. Because, yeah, because in a sense, you don't get his consciousness. Yeah, you get the sort of interaction. Yeah. With, with everything else. And so I sort of take the the straightforward attitude that uh, for that reason, it's none of my affair, you know. I mean, um, and uh, work with what I can work with, you know. So. Do we know anything about his relationship with his wife, the model? Uh, it seems to have been close. Uh, I mean, they, they, there's no reason, right? I mean, there's no reason to believe. I mean, they were they they were pretty tight, those two. Yeah. So were Edward and Joe, but when yeah. you read their diaries, wow. Well, they. Well, I can't. You know. Uh, I, I have an idea. Yeah. For a second, and that's to break the fourth wall. Right. <laughs> because there are a lot of other people in there. We could probably do this a lot, and we probably will uh, <laughs> right after we exit the room. But there probably are comments. Uh, or questions that, that you all have, having sat through quite different voices um, coming together this afternoon. Are there questions or comments somebody would like to share? Otherwise, we'll just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> yes, do, do, do you want, is there a microphone? Can you speak loudly? And So the question was if someone uh, or, or several uh, people in the group could, could comment on objects and the way objects are represented in the paintings that have been shown. Yeah. Um, do you mean like still life objects within these interiors? Yes. Well, I mean like in Room in New York, the one that's so often, sorry, Room in Brooklyn with the back view from 32 that's so often compared to Hammerskoy, there is um, a vase with flowers. Uh, it may be one the only vase of uh, flowers in any Hopper painting. Uh, it's kind of cursory. He was very condescending toward lady flower painters, very condescending, including his wife. So I think it's meant to be a cliche. That's all I can tell you about it. He didn't have too many objects um, in his interiors. They were stripped down. Could I jump in just for a second? Ara, I'm really, I was, uh, in, in to follow up on what you were just saying, I was really struck by the way in which the coded objects mm -hmm. and the historical objects and these objects that have resonance and potentially lost value, uh, um, you know, irrecoverable value appear in, in some of the works that you were talking about. And I wonder if you could talk about that as objects as, as sort of s strange signs yeah. of the unknowable, uh, of this parallel yeah. universe idea. <clears throat> yeah, um, absolutely. De Chirico's work is a, is a kind of never-ending font of arcane 
assemblages of objects, right? One of the reasons why he became so um, key to surrealist painting was because he seemed to articulate everything that the surrealists wanted to achieve. And they lived by the anthem by the 19th century poet um, Isidore Ducasse, who went by the name of the Comte de lautre and he wrote this famous a book in verse called the Les Chants de Mal d'Or, and one of its lines was the chance encounter of an umbrella and a sewing machine on an operating table. Um, so this idea of marvelous combinations of things that are put together, that don't belong together, but are put together with such a plum, such realistic clarity that they seem as if they do, which is essentially the mechanism of collage, right? I mean, de Chirico is also responding to collage, which is the, perhaps the method of the 20th century um, in both photography, film, painting, etc. cetera. Um, in my scholarship, what I found to be absent from a lot of the scholarship, which was so focused upon biographical and philological detail and the, un the, the unriddling of these signs and riddles was how little had been paid attention to space and to architecture and to the fact that the city and architecture is the most consistent trope in de Chirico's work. So how is that an object? Right. How is the syntax of the painting itself a kind of riddle rather than simply what's being uttered? Um, but I would say in terms of, of Hopper and Hammersley, one thing that perhaps um, l renders analogous these various approaches is, is the method of subtraction, right? The, the way in which objects, to the extent that they are appeared, are stripped um, and, and vacated of specificity, even in the right. case of Hopper and de Chirico, of language, right? We so rarely find text yeah. or temporal or even meteorological um, specificity to ground us in any particular place in time. So the object to the extent that it appears is one deracinated. Um, I don't know if that helps. I'm going to re-racinate yeah. okay. some objects. All right, well, go for uh, it. Just to say, no, I, I'm, it's, I, think, I think it's extremely interesting how we read, uh, how we read objects, how we read architecture, because I, I, I think that architecture is an object to be explored. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, certainly um, invented. I mean, ob uh, artists curate their own canvases always, right? And the thing I was going to say about some of um, Hammershoy's works, it's really intriguing to me to think about objects as markers of time or foreclosing the opportunity to think about time, because he and his wife uh, very specifically collected Biedermeier furniture, early, early 19th century furniture, which was totally out of style hmm. already by the 1860s. And they went around buying the stuff. Yeah. And then very specifically, he painted all that stuff in small little mm -hmm. bits in his canvases. And I do think that they're, for the contemporary office, or, uh, contemporary office, contemporary viewer, markers of a kind of lost time. Yeah. I think they're super interesting in terms of the valence that they carried, these you know, large sofas and chairs and old prints with slightly damaged frames. I think that they, mm -hmm. they carry with them a kind of a Nostalgia, but it's kind of a failed nostalgia. I mean, that's where I think it's super it's interesting. Evacuated. It's an evacuated nostalgia, but it yeah. still carries it still carries it forward. There is the parallel I mentioned to you earlier when we were talking about Edward Hopper's um, fascination with what he called the American scene and the lost American scene, and and in his case, Victorian detail. I didn't show it, but there is a watercolor of um, called. <clears throat> Mrs. Acorn's parlor from the 20s, which is in the Museum of Modern Art, which is a Victorian in interior from the late 20s, painted in Maine, where he saw it. And there are, um, there, you know, the Victorian, the mansard roof, the house by the railroad. There's a lot of nostalgia in architecture. Those are not his interiors, but his exteriors. Mm -hmm. But there is that parallel. Mm -hmm. Oh, fantastic. Uh, only a later. Um, there are some hands that are actually. Up. So um, again, do you want to speak very loudly since you don't have a microphone? And there are, I think, four hands that I'm seeing. So do you want to go first? OK. Well, this is a very pragmatic question from an architectural point of view. And with hundreds of people seeing the setting sun uptown and the screen waiting in line at least to get in, uh, I'm wondering, and the way we teach this from an architectural point of view, could, it, could you, any of you know when he actually painted the sunlight coming through those windows? Because even though it's less so in Denmark, but it's particularly so, so in Norway and Sweden, after all, sunlight's pretty precious. I mean, you have twilight in the months of November, well, late November, but December, January, and February. 
Do we know when he painted that light coming in? Because I think part of it is just simply celebrating the mm. warmth and beauty of sunlight. Mm. But am I completely naive about that? Some of them are pretty cold paintings, right? Yeah, cold, cold paintings? Oh. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, just to say, I, timing? Don't know. No, I don't. I, no. I, I mean, that could be, I, could, I can find out, but I've never, I've never actually looked to see what month it is, but I assume that, sorry, uh, I assume that it is uh, sometime between, say, um, May and September. I'd also say it's pretty cold sunlight. Yeah. When you hold that up side by side with those hoppers That's with that true. golden honey light coming in. It's very cold light, and it could have surely been at one in the afternoon in January. That's true. Hmm. Don't That's know. True. Yeah. And it could be a celebration of the warmth of nature, uh, in uh, illuminating the interior. It doesn't. We can all project. I mean, the point is we project. Yeah. But right. It's a good question, yeah. but don't know. Uh, to push this firmly back into the uncanny uh, mode, uh, my background is in film studies, and in particular S. W. Murnau. Mm. Mm -hmm. and Nosferatu, in which he mines a lot of discussion, a lot of topics today. And I was hoping that someone there might talk about the ideas of, of condensation. I mean, you folks have your own words for it, but when I see uh, Nosferatu I, and, the, and the, the very deliberate attempt to pull together famous paintings and cast tableaus, I see also the very attempt, deliberate attempts to condense the material into dreamscapes. Mm -hmm. And so I was hoping I could get some feedback from, from Hello? <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't recognize the tableaus. You know, I sort of stop at 1700, so I think I might have to do Casper Friedrich in, in mm. particular. A lot of Friedrich. Oh, yeah, seems too late for me. No. Do you want to Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. There, uh, there is another uh, filmmaker who's also relevant here, and that's Dreyer. Right, and that, mm -hmm. that connection has yeah. right that 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 connection has been made, and there is a sense in which um, there's a uh, th there's condensation of uh, visual imagery, and there is a sort of uh, there is almost a um, montage in still time in a sense in the way that in in the way that uh, the the really regnant rectilinearity of of uh, shot selection. Uh, and the um, the the creation of quietude that is extremely quiet, ex extremely oppressive. It comes out of the uh, it comes out a lot of, of the sort of compositional choices made by people like Hammer. So I mean that connection has been drawn very clearly. So there's clearly uh, an influence there, in t but it often is more about. Um, more about mood and more about atmosphere than it is about editing, you know, in, in that sense, if that answers your... Well, the monochromatic also, the black and white, of course, adds to this, but yeah. also this whole dreamscape of a lot of stuff that was talked about today in silent films in particular, which do evoke this idea of a dream world, uh, which I see a lot of in, in a lot of the paintings I saw today. Mm -hmm. That's more your turn. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think Murnau was probably more interested in, in expressionism... Um, and, and symbolist painting than he was in probably the, the more sort of naturalist origins of some, are, some of Hammersor's work. Um, I mean, the real sort of, yeah. um, obviously the, 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 the play of light and darkness and in, in evoking kind of monstrosity is really far more you know, rooted in expressionism. The art historian Angela de la Vaque has done a, a study of Murnau and painting, um, which I'm not sure if you know, but it's quite interesting. Um, okay. <laughs> I guess I've also been thinking, looking at Margaret and Susan sitting next to one another, and th thinking about um, this question of color, and it's really, it's really f kind of fascinating. Margaret, I was thinking about your talk and the incredible visceral response, first of all, that we had to the work, to the works themselves, to the, to the texts that you brought in, to the atrocities that you were calling attention to as intersecting with uh, ways you might read Rembrandt. But big, bright, bold, visceral colors invite a kind of um, bodily material relationship. And I was thinking, you know, I think about your work, Susan, in which when an artist very specifically is painting interior scenes or like this scape, this constant, you know, like mindscape of uh, Hammerschel's apartment, uh, evacuated of color, 
Um, I, I think it's another one of those ambivalences that keeps us trapped, but also doesn't it doesn't enable a physical something proximate. I find it really the question of color really interesting that way. That's interesting well, because the, um, the it's interesting because when you think of the Peter Samaritan, I mean, you go into those spaces, and so that is almost monochromatic, and that's mm -hmm. it's not the vis the um, visceral, empathic, emotional engagement, but there's some kind of entrance, entrance into the space. I don't quite know what to make of it then. And, and if I can just add something about Degas, he really labored over the box that's in the middle of the interior because it has a kind of luminosity that nothing else in the other uh, painting does. And he sort of, we talk about, we've talked about suppression and uh, reduction. He sort of clouded over what was underneath it. But later, he kept this, that painting in his studio his entire life and didn't show it to very many people. But he painted flowers on the back wall, which were not there earlier. So it's, you're not sure whether he's trying, is it a push-pull thing? Yeah. Because the painting's very, very dark. Yeah. But that box is radiant, and those flowers, too. Funny decisions that artists uh, yeah. make. Yeah. We we realize we're 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 sort of over time. We promised we'd release you at five o'clock. We all keep talking, but if there is one further question, we will address it. Otherwise, we can speak informally. And and um, I, first of all, I want it's like a, a to be asked to organize a symposium uh, meant that I could invite some of the smartest people I knew to come and, and speak about the things dear to them that may, uh, may or may not and hopefully help to illuminate this artist upstairs in unexpected ways. So I want to thank all of you for your extraordinary um, oh, thank you, presentations. Pat. Thank and you, Pat. to all of you.